Hi everyone, my name is Selena. I am a 2023 Canals Fellow on the Canals Lunch and Learn Committee. And on behalf of the committee, we're pleased to introduce Dr. Lexi Sturm. Lexi is from the DC area originally, but she moved to Florida for college and her graduate career. Uh, she graduated with her PhD in December 22, 2022 in Integrative Biology from Florida Atlanta University Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute. And her dissertation focused on coral genetic connectivity. She's worked across multiple NOAA offices, including the National Marine Sanctuaries, the Office of Protected Resources, and now she is a Canals Fellow in the Coral Reef Conservation Program. Outside of work, Lexi loves traveling, cooking, and by that she means eating, trying new wines and tropical cocktails, dancing, reading poorly written novels, and playing with dogs. So happy to turn it over to you now, Lexi. All right. Thank you, Selena, for that introduction. Um, like you mentioned in my intro, I'm from the DC area, and in high school, I had the wonderful opportunity to work in NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. So really from a young age, I was really introduced to this intersection of science and management and policy in the marine realm. And the marine ecosystem, I've always, always been most passionate about, passionate about working with, were coral reefs. And so in this talk, I'm really gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the research I did in my old graduate lab at FAU Harbor Branch, and then also some of the more coral reef management and policy work I've been doing during my Canals Fellowship at the NOAA Coral Reef Conservation Program. So launching into my research background, it's really focused on two main topics, the first of which being mesophotic coral ecosystems. So when most people think of coral reefs, a lot of times they're thinking of what we call shallow coral reef ecosystems, which are traditionally defined as occurring from the surface, so zero meters, all the way down to 30 meters. And that just is really kind of an arbitrary boundary that coincides with the recreational scuba diving limit. But my lab was really interested in studying deeper so-called mesophotic coral ecosystems, meso meaning middle and photic meaning light. So these are lower light coral reef communities, but the light levels are still high enough for light dependent uh, species like corals and algae to grow. And so in addition to mesophotic coral ecosystem work, uh, we also focused heavily on coral health and disease especially with the outbreak of a disease called stony coral tissue loss disease, which has really hammered the Caribbean coral populations over the past decade. So what these two research avenues, while they're kind of independent, they had a number um, of approaches in common, including a heavy emphasis on both field work and molecular work, as well as a lot of data analysis and bioinformatics, and really um, a common desire to translate scientific data into direct re management recommendations or approaches. So starting with the main focus of my PhD, I really focused on studying population genetic connectivity of benthic marine invertebrates. And this is a screenshot from an interactive app my lab mate Ryan Eckert designed to track our sample metadata and project progression. And the, all of these green dots right here are our um, sampling sites. And we have collected more than 3,000 samples of benthic invertebrates, and we've already sequenced more than 2,000 of them. And the species we're working with is Montastria cavernosa. That's my personal favorite. That's what I focused on through most of my PhD, also called the great star coral, and I think it's pretty great. Um, Orbicella fabulata, Parides astroides, Stephanosinia intercepta, and the odd man out, the only non-coral we've been working with so far, is Zestospongia muta, or the giant barrel sponge. So we collected these samples in a variety of ways and our approach is really depended uh, based upon depth. And so we have really shallow samples that we collected um, just on snorkel, some deeper samples on recreational scuba. Uh, if we went a little deeper, we probably got into some decompression diving. Even deeper, uh, we worked with some trimix, so a little bit of helium in our, in our gas mixtures. And then eventually we moved from open circuit into closed circuit rebreathers. So these recirculate um, your air and that allows you to um, stay deeper and longer and do longer decompression. And well, if we had very deep samples that uh, divers couldn't access, we would use remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. And these are basically underwater robots that can go um, sample and take surveys for you. So one of the first research projects I worked on was I really was interested in examining how genetically similar or dissimilar populations of this coral, Montastria cavernosa, were surrounding the Cuban archipelago. 
So we had initially planned to go back to Cuba multiple times and collect lots of samples. But of course, due to shifting political situations and things like that, we couldn't return after our first trip. So we really had to make do with a relatively small sample set. So I wanted to see if trying to use different genetic approaches would lead to improved resolution of the data with the sample set we had available. And so we used two approaches to um, run a comparison. We first used microsatellite approaches, which are shown on the right. Um, these are a more traditionally used genetic marker. Uh, they're cheaper to sequence. The, you don't need very high quality DNA to get them to amplify, but you need lots and lots of sample replicates to work with to get really good um, data resolution and patterns because you're working with relatively few markers. In this case, we had nine microsatellite markers for this species. So I wanted to try using approaches that use a different genetic marker, this one called single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs for short. And these tend to be more expensive to sequence. They tend to be a little bit finicky about the DNA that you're, you're using. Um, but you can get orders of magnitude more markers. And so in the case of this project, I generated more than 9,000 SNP markers. So that's two orders of magnitude more genetic markers than we had available with the microsatellites. And what we found that, yes, with the small sample set we had to use, the SNPs way outperformed the microsatellites in resolving uh, significant patterns of genetic differentiation across Cuba. So then when we decided that the SNP approach was the way to go, we began assessing levels of vertical genetic connectivity between shallow and deeper mesophotic populations. So why do we wanna study this? Well, there's a thought that these corals in these deeper mesophotic waters may be more buffered from thermal or other stresses, other stressors than their shallow counterparts. And so there's this thought that these mesophotic populations may persist even when shallow populations are declining. So people are really interested in what potential these mesophotic populations may have to reseed and regenerate shallow populations if there's decline. So we can use genetics to really try to address this question. If there seems to be some genetic similarity, that would indicate that there is some mixing between these shallow and mesophotic populations and vice versa. And so what we found really overall, and this is across multiple studies led both by me and my lab mate, uh, Ryan Eckert, uh, across the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary and in the Southern Gulf of Mexico. And we found that it really varies at a site by site, reef by reef basis, whether or not there's genetic mixing or genetic connectivity between shallow and mesophotic populations on the same reef. So I thought that was really interesting. And then my overarching dissertation chapter, which actually just came out this week, pretty exciting. I'm finally really done with the PhD work, um, but it was a regional analysis of shallow mesophotic Montasia cavernosa again. And we were trying to look at the connectivity across all those sites, all those green dots indicated on that map. And we wanted to look at both the shallow and the mesophotic populations. So we had 16 regional populations, over 750 unique coral genets, so unique genotypes, and what we found was, yes, while the vertical genetic connectivity, so the, the, the similarity or mixing between shallow and mesophotic reefs did vary on a site-by-site -site basis, in general, there is significant genetic differentiation across depth. Meaning, say you're you know, a coral here off the coast of Cuba, a shallow coral off the coast of Cuba, you're much more likely to be genetics, genetically similar to another shallow coral in the Florida Keys, you know, hundreds of kilometers away, than you are to be to a mesophotic coral that might only be, you know, a few hundred meters away, but 30 meters deeper than you. And we wanted to study not only how that coral host varies across depth, but how the tiny little microscopic algal symbionts that the coral host keeps um, within itself, in symbiosis within itself, we wanted to see if those tend to vary across depth as well. And what we found is that yes, in general, the, the species of algal symbionts or the genotypes of algal symbionts do tend to vary across depth. And this is not really surprising because these corals are experiencing really different conditions, especially really different light levels and light quality at say five meters depth versus 35 meters depth. So it would make sense to host a type of algal symbiont that is best suited for that type of habitat. 
We not only examined um, population genetic structure across depth, but really how reef species communities also varied across depth as well. And a lot of this was conducted with remotely operated vehicle-based surveys. And here's just some examples of how uh, the coral communities really vary um, across depth gradients, both in Cuba and in the Florida Keys. And then moving on to more of the coral health and disease side of the research, much of this work was led by my lab mates and collaborators, but they let me come help out in the field and in the lab from time to time. Uh, but this is stony coral tissue loss disease. You can see all of this white um, exposed, like white tissue and exposed skeleton on this coral. And it first was discovered off the coast of Florida in 2014, but people really started noticing it spreading when we were doing a lot of post-Hurricane Irma monitoring across Florida's coral reefs. And so we did a lot of overarching reef surveys, my lab mate Ian Combs started to develop um, a 3D photogrammetry, so a 3D modeling approach. And he was tracking colonies that had this disease over time, trying to measure how fast that they were losing tissue. And then I had another lab mate, Aaron Schilling, as well as other collaborators who began testing various ways to actually treat this disease. And they found that using amoxicillin, the same antibiotic that you might've been prescribed for strep throat or something like that, um, when mixed into this special paste and applied to lesions, that SETLD lesions, it was actually pretty successful at treating these individual lesions. And so when we figured that out, we started um, applying uh, to as many corals as possible across Florida's coral reef, hoping to save a lot of these colonies. We also wanted to study um, the relationship between the holobionts genetics, so both the coral host and its algal symbionts, and how that may relate to how susceptible or resistant a coral is to this disease. So we worked with the coral Orbicella fabulata, and we did this both because it's a really important species ecologically, and also because it shows high within species variability to, um, to resistance of the disease. So some colonies stay really healthy and have not seemed to have gotten the disease, even though it's been on the reef for years, and other colonies seem to stay sick, have the disease, despite if we treat them multiple times. And so we wanted to see if genetics of the host played any role. And so this shows here relationships between different colonies. The red ones were sick colonies and green ones were healthy colonies, never got sick. And there's really no clear pattern in the genetic relationship um, of these colonies and like no real genetic linkage to the ones that got sick or didn't get sick. But we also wanted to look at their algal symbiont community structure. And so this is showing on the left, the ones that stayed healthy and on the right, um, the ones that got diseased. And the ones that got diseased were much more likely to have this purple uh, genus of algal symbiont called Durastinium. And that was a little surprising uh, because this is normally a more tolerant symbiont, or thought to be a thermally tolerant symbiont at least, um, but it wasn't an, an interesting pattern that we've seen associated with having SCTLD. So it did seem like there was an algal symbiont connection. We also wanted to examine if nutrient enrichment had any effect on stony coral tissue loss disease progression. And this was led by my, uh, my friend, Ashley Carrera. And she added small bags of fertilizer to some of the colonies that had SCTLD. We would return to these colonies every few days and measure lesion progression. Um, and we took water samples to assess nutrient concentrations. And we monitored the surrounding experimental colonies to ensure that we weren't driving any stony coral tissue loss disease outbreaks. But interestingly enough, we did not really find strong evidence of a link between nutrient amendments or putting more nutrients in the water and faster stony coral tissue loss disease progression. And lastly, I wanna highlight, we worked on a project um, to outplant SCTLD susceptible corals. So following this SCTLD outbreak going through the Florida reef tract, we lost almost 100% at some sites of these really susceptible species. So we wanted to know, now that we're moving kind of from an epidemic phase to a more disease endemic phase, what would happen if we outplanted some of these species that are susceptible to SCTLD? Would they grow and survive or would they just get wiped out again? So we outplanted Montachia cavernosa, again, my favorite coral, Orbicella fabulata, and uh, uh, Pseudodeploria clavosa, which is seen here on the right. You can see that they start off as these little individual um, fragments, and these are all from the same genotype. So eventually they start to fuse together, which you can see here on the right side. 
We took samples of these corals to genotype them and also to see if their owl symbionts may have shifted or shuffled um, after being outplanted. And so that work is still ongoing. But just really to summarize, um, the genetic data generated in these studies really had important impacts on a variety of management outputs, including designations and expansions of various domestic and international networks of coral reef marine protected areas. Uh, the genetic data was also mined for a variety of reasons, including to uh, create sweeps, uh, suites of SNP markers to rapidly genotype corals that were taken off the reef and rescued and put into land-based nurseries, both during the stony coral tissue loss disease epidemic and um, during this recent bleaching outbreak. And a lot of my lab mix work has been used to better understand stony coral tissue loss disease susceptibility, how it varies across species and even within species, inform intervention approaches and treatments, inform restoration and to manage water quality. And I just wanna point out that we all have a really strong commitment to making sure our data is publicly available and that our protocols are open sourced. So you can find a lot of them um, via GitHub repositories and all of our genetic data is online through the NCBI database, publicly available and accessible. So shifting a little bit to my Canals Fellowship, uh, when you do the Canals Fellowship, they really want you to keep an open mind and do something outside of the box of what you have worked on previously but I still felt really passionate about corals and uh, felt strongly about continuing to work with them. So I was really thrilled when I got the opportunity to work with NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. And just because I have a coral reef background, I feel like it didn't really help me that much because this fellowship is really about working with people. And I got to work with not only the CRCP team that's pictured here, but also the US Coral Reef Task Force, which I'll talk a little bit about, and the International Coral Reef Initiative. So I joke that this is kind of three fellowships for the price of one. So starting out a little bit about uh, the Coral Reef Conservation Program. It's a matrix program. And I always think of matrix the movie, but not like that. It just means a partnership between the various NOAA line offices that work with coral reef issues. So we have NOS, OAR, NIMPS, and NESDIS. And we work across seven inhabited coral reef jurisdictions. And in the Atlantic, that includes Florida, the US Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. And in the Pacific, that includes Hawaii, Guam, American Samoa, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. We also work across a number of um, relatively uninhabited reefs uh, that are indicated in light blue. And we also engage in a variety of international efforts as well, um, primarily throughout the Caribbean, Micronesia, the Coral Triangle, and the South Pacific. And so the Coral Reef Conservation Program is really guided by its strategic plan that has four main goals. Increasing coral reef resilience to climate change, improving coral reef fishery sustainability, reducing land-based sources of pollution, and restoring uh, viable coral populations. So some of the main um, responsibilities I had throughout the fellowship really varied a lot, but one of them that was really CRCP focused uh, was helping to run the social media account. And so it was really fun to be creative. I worked closely with our communications lead, Caroline Donovan, and it was really um, a cool experience trying to make coral reefs kind of fun and relatable. So, you know, I tried to make a joke that parrotfish are the ken of the reefs and that um, American Samoa has reefs that mean girls would be quite proud of. And then on a more serious note, it was kind of an interesting time to come in. Uh, our underlying statute, the Coral Reef Conservation Act, was recently reauthorized um, by Congress. So that came with kind of some changes in how the program is implemented. So I really got a cool um, chance to both learn about the process of implementing policies and play a role in sort of adapting the program to these new changes. And one of those examples is that it was working um, with the Coral Reef Conservation Program on their grants program. Uh, it's recently renamed uh, for Dr. Ruth Gates, who is a really important um, coral reef scientist who worked primarily in Hawaii, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. And so um, the grants program is now named um, in her honor. And I got to specifically work uh, with this grant called the Restoration Innovation Grant, and it's notice of funding opportunities coming out soon, which is really exciting. Um, but it's a really cool grant looking to support integrating intervention techniques to make corals being used for restoration, so outplanted corals, really more resilient to stressors. Because we don't wanna just spend a lot of money outplanting corals just to have them wiped out by the same stressors that we're trying to restore 
you know, the corals from in the first place. So it was a really nice opportunity to get used to use my background in coral molecular ecology and help to prioritize some of these different approaches. I also got to participate in the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program. This is a standardized national monitoring program that the Coral Reef Conservation Program helps to implement. And I actually got to participate on a mission. So I got to go to St. John in the US Virgin Islands. I got to dive for two weeks and collect data. And it was a really awesome experience. And I just want to put in a quick plug that just yesterday, they released a new data visualization tool, which makes it super easy to access, analyze, and download anything from benthic to fish to climate to socioeconomic data from reefs across the country. So I would go check it out if you have a moment, look up the National Coral Reef Monitoring Program data visualization tool and it should come up. It's a really great tool. So the second major aspect of my portfolio, this uh, CNAUS Fellowship was the US Coral Reef Task Force, which is an interagency, intergovernmental partnership co-chaired by both NOAA and the Department of Interior and also has members from 12 other federal agencies from the seven representatives from the seven state and territories with coral reefs and representatives from the three, free, three freely associated states. And most recently I got to help onboard our newest representatives from the four of the fisheries management councils uh, that have coral reefs within their region. So it's really cool that it's such a huge partnership all working um, across seven issue specific working groups that really focus on the following coral reef issues, uh, coral disease, communications about coral reef science and management, corals and climate change, fisheries and ecosystem management, enforcement, restoration, and watersheds. So it's really cool. They do a lot of great work and um, you should check us out. And so one of the main responsibilities that I had with the task force was uh, organizing steering committee meetings. We met virtually on a monthly basis, but I also got to help plan two amazing and super effective in-person coral reef task force meetings, one in the spring in Washington, DC, and one uh, more recently, this past October, in St. Thomas in the US Virgin Islands. And so that was a really cool experience to get to engage with people in person. We had the governor from the Virgin Islands come, governor from the governor from American Samoa come, and then we had representatives from the White House, including Chair Brenda Mallory, um, the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, who came and attended and engaged and really got to um, learn about how important coral reefs are. Another highlight of my fellowship was really getting to engage across the different working groups. And I worked on a lot of different projects across all of them, but I'm just going to highlight two big ones. Uh, I got to lead the drafting of a restoration permitting guidance document. And this um, helps share information with coral restoration practitioners on what kind of permits or consultations they may need to conduct restoration activities in their jurisdiction. Then I also engaged a lot with the coral disease working group, and I got to help plan um, and carry out the logistics of a Caribbean coral disease response workshop that was held in Puerto Rico. So that was a really cool opportunity. And then the last aspect, but not the least of my portfolio is NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program's international engagement. And I worked mostly with the International Coral Reef Initiative or ICRI, which is a huge international partnership of all these countries showed here. And the US is the current um, chair of ICRI. So I helped to plan the ICRI general meeting, which was held in person in Kona, Hawaii. And I got to participate on a youth panel and we really got to share our thoughts, our opinions, and our priorities for coral reef conservation and some cre creative approaches we would take to um, kind of mitigate the current stressors to coral reefs. So that was a really great opportunity to get to address the body directly. And another one of the main focuses of the ICRI meeting was to expand the coral reef community. And that not only included connecting with youth, but also with trying to collaborate with indigenous people and seek to incorporate indigenous and local knowledge into policies and management plans. Uh, so as part of the meeting, uh, we worked with uh, this awesome Native Hawaiian cultural educator, Kumu Kiala, who incorporated a lot of really important cultural and spiritual aspects into our meeting and really taught us why coral reefs are not only ecologically and economically important to Hawaii, but also culturally important as well. And we also kicked off the meeting with a listening session with indigenous coral reef managers, not only from Hawaii, but across the world to share their stories and lead us in a discussion of how we can better incorporate not only indigenous knowledge and practice, 
but really recruit and, and involve more indigenous community members into coral reef management and decision-making processes. And this really dovetailed nicely with another project I was working on where I was conducting oral history interviews with Hawaiian researchers and cultural leaders on the importance of coral reefs. And you can check out those oral history interviews on the NOAA Voices site. And with that, I would really like to thank everybody, um, the Voss Lab, my Knauss members, Jennifer Koss and Mike Lehmeyer, and then all of my mentors. I had an amazing group of mentors across NOAA, CRCP, the Coral Reef Task Force, and the International Coral Reef Initiative. Um, that QR code leads to my personal website, so feel free to follow up with me if you have any more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. I really appreciated your presentation. Um, so we're going to take the next five minutes or so for, to answer any questions that you have. So please uh, put any questions you have in the questions chat box, and I will read them to Lexi. And before you log off, take a look at her PDF presentation, which she shared with us. Feel free to, to uh, download it. It's packed with information. So we, we got a couple of questions while you were speaking. I'm going to go ahead and start with those questions now, Lexi. Uh, this first one asks, are there specific challenges or considerations in ens ensuring the survival of these transplanted corals in varying environments? Yeah. So kind of how I touched on, I think uh, if you're referring to coral restoration or, or outplanting these corals, yeah, there's a lot of considerations because a lot of the threats are still ongoing, right? So we've lost a lot of corals, like I mentioned, to this stony coral tissue loss disease outbreak. And then this past summer, um, we, had a, we had a bleaching event. So we lost a lot of corals, unfortunately, or we're still learning about the total mortality, but a lot of corals um, got bleached. And so you know, if you able, if you are able to keep these corals in land-based nurseries and propagate them and then outplant them, the question becomes, you know, do they face that same threat again? And, and do you just lose that coral that you spent a lot of work and a lot of money on trying to outplant? And so that's what's interesting um, about a lot of the research is, is trying to make the corals that we're outplanting um, more tolerant to these types of stressors. So whether that be um, more thermally tolerant or more tolerant to disease. And so there's a lot of really cool work in terms of manipulating the types of algal symbionts they have to make them more thermally tolerant or um, focusing on different specialized uh, gen genotypes or genetic strains of corals that may be more stress tolerant. And so that is definitely a huge consideration and something that, that people are working on as we're working on trying to scale up restoration efforts. Thank you. Uh, this next person asked, actually asked two questions, so I'll start with the first. Typically, coral reef management slash conservation approaches from various organizations focus on shallow water coral reefs down mm -hmm. to 100 meters. Based on your research and work experiences, why should organizations consider including deeper mesophotic reefs in future management slash conservation efforts? Yeah, absolutely. So I think mesophotic reefs are really important, and a lot of people really at first we're focusing on them as, as potential refugia. And I think in some cases they may act as refugia. So they may be, you know, hold certain types of coral populations and they may be able to reseed shallow populations, but we're now kind of really seeing that they're more distinct. And I think the fact that they are distinct and they are this unique source, both of species and genetic diversity means that inherently they warrant protection. A lot of times they're also really important habitat for fisheries. And so a lot of really economically important um, fish species like groupers have their spawning aggregations in mesophotic depths. And we just really don't know much information about what's out there. In some cases, there's the thought that there might be a lot more mesophotic habitat than shallow habitat, and we just have not explored that. And so I think we really need to explore it. And almost everywhere you go, you know, if you're aiming to find a mesophotic coral reef, you find a really diverse ecosystem that warrants protection. Excellent. The second question this person asks is, considering your research took place in both domestic and foreign Caribbean locations, mm -hmm. to what extent has your research demonstrated the how of international, international conversation? Oh, how can, I'm sorry, let me repeat this. How international conservation can benefit coral reefs in domestic locations? Yeah, that's a really awesome question. So a lot of these reef systems that are up current 
from reef systems, for example, in the Florida Keys or the Flower Garden Banks off the coast of Texas, um, a lot of reef systems that are upcurrent and are potentially really important sources of not only coral larvae, but fish larvae and other things like that are in other countries' waters. So especially in Mexico and in Cuba, when we're talking about Gulf of Mexico reefs, but other countries in the Western Caribbean as well, are likely really important larval sources for us. And so it would behoove us to help those countries protect those really important coral reef resources that are sources to our reefs that are downstream that might be important sinks, so might receive a lot of the um, larval input. And so, yeah, it, it it's, you know, corals don't respect international boundaries, fish don't respect international boundaries. So we really need to work collectively to manage these connected coral reef ecosystems. This last question uh, actually kind of ties into this. It asks, how would you say having all these policy and partner works has changed or enhanced your view of coral reef conservation? Yeah, I think it has given me a lot of hope. Like I think, you know, despite a really tough summer um, for coral reefs and, and for the people who work with them, I think it's been really amazing to see all these partnerships at the international and the domestic level and, and see how these people are working from so many different angles. And everybody is really passionate about the coral reefs that they, that they work with. And so um, that has been really heartening to me. And I think the science and the management is really starting to, to work together. So like, you know, we have, we have a lot of amazing research that I think can ensure that coral reefs are persisting into the future. And it's now working to make sure that we can scale that up and actually start applying it um, to, to make sure we're, we're restoring reefs and protecting and conserving the ones that, that are still bright spots and still really healthy.